The adequate notice of this regular meeting as required by the Open Public Meetings Act was provided by the posting, mailing, delivery, and filing of the notice on January 6, 2021. This notice was on that date posted on the bulletin board in the township office, sent to the Courier News, the Echo Sentinel, and tapped into Warren, and filed with the township clerk of the township of Warren all in accordance with the requirements of the Open Public Meetings Act. Uh, please join young Harry Franco in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Good job, buddy. Thanks, bud. Mrs. Lenhart. Mr. Ballish. Here. Mr. Bishi. Here. Mr. Brzee. Here. Mrs. Clark. Here. Mrs. DiMaggio. Here. Ms. Keller. Here. Mr. Weinstein. Here. Mrs. Zahn. Here. And Mr. Franco. Here. We have a quorum and may proceed. Uh, resolved that the Board of Education approves the public session minutes of the February 16th, 2021 meeting. Second. Mr. Ballish. Yes. Mr. Bishi. Yes. Mr. Brzee. Yes. Mrs. Carr. Yes. Mrs. DiMaggio. Yes. Ms. Keller. Yes. Mr. Weinstein. Yes. Mrs. Zahn. Yes. And Mr. Franco. Yes. Motion carries. Correspondence and information, Dr. Mingle. Thank you, Mr. Franco. No HIB or suspensions to report. Uh, the board did receive eight emails from five individuals on return to school topics and an email from the Bernards Township Board of Education indicating that it had passed a resolution encouraging the governor to apply for a waiver from state testing for this year. And I also reported to the board on 34 additional pieces of correspondence from parents and staff. That's it for that section, Mr. Franco. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mingle. So today we have quite a few uh, presentations to get through. The first of which is going to be the first of our um, overviews of our schools. So there's gonna be a presentation for, um, about ALT. I assume there'll be lots of smiling, happy children involved in the presentation. I see already some kids attending the meeting to, to see themselves in the presentation. So we look forward to that. Uh, a couple of uh, things to note, the second presentation is gonna be the uh, return to school presentation that Dr. Mingle will give us. A couple of things to make note of with respect to that presentation. Uh, one is that today was the first day we had all of the third graders uh, back in school on a five day schedule. So today is day one of that. We're excited to, to announce that that went fairly smoothly today as far as I'm aware. Uh, on the agenda today and being voted on for approval is to bring back the fourth and fifth graders. Uh, and that will be in effect, assuming it passes uh, two weeks from today. And then the third thing I'd like you to take notice of is, is agenda item A3, uh, which regards the middle school. So up to this point, we have taken the approach and the administration has taken the approach on advice of the back to school committee that we should be following all of the safety guidelines established by the uh, CDC. Uh, we have heard from the community on this issue and we take seriously the feedback. And so the, feed, the agenda item that's up uh, on A3 today directs the administration to do two things. One, to give us a recommended return to the school plan for the middle school that brings back all of the kids that want to come back. And that plan, I assume that they would recommend would be one that follows all of the guidelines. Assuming that that does not bring all of the kids back, that plan, because it's unlikely that we'll be able to do that as we've all discussed in previous meetings. The second directive in that uh, agenda item uh, asked that the administration to come to us with a second plan that would bring all of the kids back 
that would then have to overcome the, um, the guideline hurdles and what that would look like. So at the next meeting, we expect to see um, probably two plans and we would have to then make decision at that point uh, how to move forward. But we think that uh, within, at the next meeting, we will have very good information on how to bring back the middle school kids um, on a five day schedule. So please take note of that and keep that in mind as we go through the um, return to school presentation. And then the third, uh, the third presentation today will be on the proposed referendum and Mrs. Lenhart will lead us through that. Um, so with that, um, Dr. Mingle. Thank you, Mr. Franco. Just a couple of quick things before we get into the presentations. First of all, it's really great to see the smiling faces of our ALT students. So welcome all the students who are here tonight. Good to see you all. You're gonna see yourself on your video in just a few minutes. We're almost there, I promise. Second, uh, I wanna thank the staff especially and, and all of our parents for their uh, patience and understanding last week when we had our transportation delay. Our principals, our staff rose to the, uh, the, the occasion as they always do to make sure that students were safe uh, in schools where they needed to be until we could safely transport them home. So thank you everybody for that. Uh, the governor did announce as I'm sure you all saw just today that Teachers will become eligible for vaccines beginning March 15th, which is obviously extremely positive news. He also said in that statement, a little comment that said, we're going to work on the hurdles to getting the vaccines to teachers. And I take that to mean that there might still be a window for us to be a vaccination site. For those of you that aren't already aware, we did all the legwork back in the fall to make sure that we could actually make Warren Middle School an educator only vaccine site. Assuming that that is something that comes back on the table, we'll be ready to go with our school physicians so that we can get our staff vaccinated as fast as possible. And uh, as Mr. Franco said, we are kicking off our student features tonight. We'll have uh, students at different schools featured for each of the next several board meetings. Uh, always a fun part of our, our board meetings. We're trying to bring it to the virtual environment as well. So with that, um, Ms. Smith introduces it right in the video. So I think Ms. Smith, is there anything to, to add to welcome? Well, I just want to thank all of the staff and the families who joined us here tonight um, in support. You might not believe it, but lots of these children that you see on here might not even be in the video, but it speaks to how supportive they are of one another and the sentiment that we try to exhibit in this presentation for this evening. So thank you to all of my dolphins out there. You make me really proud and I'm excited to highlight all of you and the work that our entire school has done together about morning meeting. Thank you, just give me one second and I'll start the video. In the past, we would start every school day with quick morning announcements, Pledge of Allegiance, and jump right into our academics. But undoubtedly, something would happen where we would have to sacrifice academic time to have a discussion, time to talk with one another about something that was really important at the moment. And that happened quite a bit. And it always felt like a power play between the social emotional well-being and the academic time. So in 2019, we felt like it was time for us to make that time, that conversation time, a priority for us. And we built morning meeting into our daily schedule. It's about 20 minutes, which are devoted to, yes, community building, but for us at ALT, we wanted to make it even more than that. We took a look at our Alveus anti-bullying survey data and our whole child survey data, and we found that our children have really strong empathy skills, and they felt as though the adults around them would advocate for them if they needed help, so they felt safe. However, they needed the skills to build their self-advocacy. So with that at ALT, we have infused the skills necessary to build their voice, to make sure they know how to solve conflicts, to incorporate mindfulness and self-regulation and infuse that within to our daily function. 
So at ALT, we are really proud of the work that we have done to not just take care of the social emotional well-being of our children, but to really let them know that their voice is important, their voice is heard, and that they matter every single school day. And then we move on to our academics. We no longer had the terrific morning meeting we have every morning. I feel like we wouldn't be as connected. And with these connections, you can build up partnerships or friends and even groups of friends. When we originally built morning meeting, we made it a priority for everyone to be on the same level. So children and staff would be sitting together in a circle on the same level so that everyone was an equal. However, during COVID, we've adapted this format so that we still have the same structure of greeting one another, sharing, but we maintain safe protocols at the same time. Good morning, Hudson. Good morning, Hudson. I like your robot greeting. Good morning, Dean. Good morning, Diora. Good morning, 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 Good Students have worked together to analyze these types of situations and ways to maintain friendships with it. And we utilize both whole class and small group discussions so that they can stay engaged and connected with one another. And each day we also try to incorporate a theme that helps guide our discussion. And whether it's talking about mindfulness, highlighting a star student, or playing a variety of games that the teachers or the students create, our class is able to connect and share moments of Positivity and laughter. Snowy or sunny? Snowy or sunny? All right, air high five, somebody in your group. Air high five. And back to center. It helped me get ready to start the day. And they, they turn to a other person and then they say, good morning, happy to see you, and then do air high five. My favorite thing at morning meeting is when we do go Thank you. Seeing all my friends. I like when we sit down on our desk and, and we share what we did that day. You do your joy journal and you can actually express what you like and what the question is. Because you get to tell about um, what you've done on the days with your weekends and uh, what I like about morning meeting is um, I like to um, hear the news and I um, like to see, um, I like to do the calendar and see how much days have we been in school and tell about our weekend sometimes. We get to share what we do or what we're going to do or what we did. We get to hear about different fun things that people do. We, we tell what we do on the 100 day of school. Um, I think morning meeting is really fun because every week we get to like sing a little song or do a little activity. I like it because we get to share every day and I like learning about other people's life. Mm. Yeah. Um, I, I like, the reason I like morning meeting is because I like the activity that Mrs. Bellinger 
comes up for us, and I also like it. I like sharing and learning about other people. I think that morning meeting is very fun because I like hearing everybody share, and um, I like the activities. It helps me understand what's happening throughout the day, like the science fair. For would you rather's, we every um, like the kids get to make their own would you rather so like holiday theme like we had Valentine's Day and winter was the latest ones and it I think it's very it, it lets us have a lot of creativity when it comes to morning meeting yeah I feel like morning meeting brings um things you also never knew about people and I feel like that matters I think morning meeting is beneficial because it helps me connect with my teachers and friends. It makes it a lot easier to connect during these hard coronavirus times because it's very hard to see people. Well, in the younger grades, like K through two, we used to just play games and just talk about our weekend if it's a Monday or say what we might do over the, over the weekend on Fridays. But now that we're in third and fifth grade and fourth grade, we've began to go more into bigger topics. Like sometimes we'll talk about COVID and other times maybe we'll talk about politics and how everything's working. And sometimes we'll just have our topics for the day. We'll have Mindful Monday, Top Dog Tuesday, Would You Rather Wednesday, things like that. And they're very fun, but I feel like we've gotten into more deeper discussions. Like we do our quotes and we talk about them. Like for example, one of them, what does uh, friendship mean to you? So we'll talk about that and we'll get deep into discussion. And I love doing that because I feel more connected with the class. Part of morning meeting um, that I really appreciate is allowing students to have the voice in the classroom to advocate for themselves. They bring topics to the classroom discussion that wouldn't traditionally be talked about, whether that's the news or rumors that they want to address. Um, morning meeting is a space for kids to be able to bring those topics and to have an open discussion without criticism um, and allows them to take charge. Rather than us teachers planning our discussions, it's student-centered and student-run. We also get into some engaging conversation, but the conversation is without criticism, which I think is very beneficial, especially maybe to those students who might be a little bit more shy and may not want to engage um, otherwise. Um, we also get to review schedules and expectations, which I think might reduce some anxiety in some of our students, which could allow for a smooth transition into the work day. I really appreciate morning meeting as a specialist because as the art teacher, it allows me a chance to connect with students outside of the art studio. So during a typical school year, I might pop into the classroom, say hello to students, get to know them, see what they're doing over the weekend, um, and just kind of connect with students and also teachers because I get to see them on a different level as well during that community time. Morning meeting has really become a safe place for our students to come to us with anything that's on their mind. We've had students come up with the most authentic conversations when something big has happened either in the local community or in the global community that we're living in, where they've had fears, loss of important members of their family, or things that they just don't understand. They come to morning meeting and we can discuss it as a whole class. We can give them better understandings of things that maybe they don't quite understand we can share and connect, and it's really a great place for that open dialogue, and it really builds a beautiful class community that we can then take for the rest of our school day. And now since the pandemic has hit, we've had to kind of make a shift in the way morning meeting has had to adapt. And because we laid that foundation at ALT last year, our students were able to run with it, and we've had to tweak we have sometimes our students are on the computers, sometimes we're all on the computers, sometimes we're on a hybrid, but regardless, it's a place for our class to come together and build that community of learners that they feel safe.
Could you imagine your day without morning meeting? No. Why not? Because morning meeting is so fun. I could not. No. No. No, I would not be able to imagine my day without morning meeting. It's just so important to socialize with people in class and at home. And also it's just really fun. I can't really imagine my day without morning meeting because it helps me connect with my classmates more. Um, it helps me interact with them, uh, especially from the different cohorts. And I like um, doing all of the fun activities with the class in the morning, especially uh, Would You Rather Wednesdays. So I can't imagine my day without morning meeting. Very nice, thank you. I, I know I'm not alone in saying that I'm sure everyone is looking forward to the day when the kids can have these meetings without masks and can actually give real high fives to one another. So I know I look forward to that day as I'm sure many of you do as well. Uh, thank you very much, kids, that was great. Um, the meeting is gonna continue with some more kind of boring adult stuff. So. Now would be a great time for you to go back and do some fun things in your house if your parents are not putting you to bed yet. So thank you very much. That was great, guys. Thanks, guys. OK. Um, Dr. Mingle. I should have thought about the order of this agenda in a, in a smarter way. It's never good to go after elementary school students. Hey, you do what you gotta do. Yeah, I know. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna, uh, the grade four and five return to school proposal. This is a relatively short video uh, for those that want the backup, you know, the last meeting, there was a much longer video. That information is still up on the website, but this is a short, just on the fourth and fifth grade proposal. Give me one second. Good evening. It's my pleasure to present a proposal for returning grades four and five students to school five days a week. As we have talked about multiple times, including just two weeks ago, our vision since last summer has been to safely return all students and staff members to the Warren Township schools. And we have been continuously operating under these guiding principles, that we will prioritize the health and safety of students and staff members above all else, that we'll follow NJDOE guidance, including physical distancing, discouraging cohort mixing, encouraging and improving hygiene practices and thinking about the mental health effects of any decisions that we make while relying on the most up-to-date information available to us. As always, our plans require us to follow and then respond to changes that might come from various entities such as New Jersey Department of Education, New Jersey Department of Health, CDC. And so everything presented tonight is based on the current guidelines and could change if anything new comes to us in the immediate future. Just to kind of bring all the different moving pieces together, Assuming stable risk conditions with COVID-19, we're at a place where this week we're implementing our hybrid 1.2. I'm very happy to have all of our grade three students back in school five days a week as of today, as well as 10% of our middle school students who qualify for certain special education programs. We're looking for approval from the board tonight for a grades four and five plan. And we are working on plans for grades six through eight within the existing guidelines as well. We anticipate coming back at the March 15th meeting uh, with more information about the middle school that can be implemented post spring break. Just as a reminder, we do still see cases going up in Warren Township and our health official reminds us that they're going up more so than in other places. And so we need to stay vigilant, especially with spring break coming in order to keep our school facilities open and operating as they've been able to do so successfully so far this year. Our regional case rate has fallen a bit uh, over the last couple of weeks. So we saw a big decline several weeks ago, which led to the state moving our region to the yellow or moderate risk level. It's now been pretty stable for a few weeks. And uh, as we did in the fall, when conditions are good, especially when they're green, we keep on bringing more and more students back. We put that in a pause 
when the giant jump came in November. And now that the jump is leading to a big decline, we are in the process of bringing students back more now as well. Just as a reminder, Central Jersey West, which includes Somerset County, is currently considered moderate risk. That's the yellow. In the moderate yellow risk, we have guidance here about a mixture of program options with hybrid and in-person. Under the federal CDC guidelines, which only went in place uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Somerset County is still listed as high transmission, which is red which encourages staying in virtual only unless you can guarantee your mitigation strategies as we have been able to do consistently all year long. So what are we looking to do two weeks from today? Continue what was our hybrid 1.2 goal of transitioning the greatest number of young students from a B hybrid to full-time in-person cohort C, given our existing resource constraints and health and safety guidelines. Why does this come next? Well, our the conditions, as long as they continue to be moving in the correct direction like they are now, and our safety practices allow us to do this, feeling confident that the safety measures are appropriate. This change will complete the return of all elementary school students to school facilities five days a week, which would be a huge accomplishment, especially considering it's recommended that we can do that without making any reductions to health and safety protocols. We know that younger students have more difficulty accessing distance learning, and we know from the CDC that the risk is lower with our younger students. The grade four and five plan on the agenda for approval tonight is based on a modeling of scenarios that were determined by a recent survey of grades four and five parents. We would implement a final re-registration this week, which could require some adjustments depending on what the final numbers look like. This is very much like our K through three process so far this year. So at grades four and five, students who are currently in cohorts A or B will move to cohort C, on March 15th, full-time distance learning students will be combined across the district and have their own dedicated teachers. Full-time in-person students will continue to be assigned to a homeroom. Now at the upper elementary grade, students already have different teachers and that will continue uh, for different subject areas. Class sizes will be affected by the maximum classroom capacity. So that'll generally be about 13 or 14 students in a traditional classroom. This plan does assume that we will move some classes out of traditional classrooms into alternate spaces, such as libraries, because we will need to have slightly larger classes, but by being in a larger space, we'll be able to do that and have the appropriate spacing maintained. Full-time distance students will be brought together across the four elementary schools. Most or many students will have a new homeroom teacher as a result, with at least one teacher for every 14 students, uh, just like we have in person. And uh, as we did with K1, 2, and 3, the schedule will be adjusted to the later school time um, to match so that we're consistent across. We will be asking for a final confirmation and reminder for our other elementary school students who volunteered to give up seats on the bus because that was one of the things that made it so we could bring back fourth and fifth grade students. So parents who said they would give up their child seat in the bus will be asked to do that as of March 15th, more information to come to those families. And we should all be prepared that this will increase arrival and dismissal traffic and slow down the process of arrival and dismissal at the elementary schools. Please be patient as we work through. You know, every time we make a change, the first few days go a little bit slow, but there will be many more cars at each school as a result of this change. Approval anticipated tonight. This will go to the Department of Education for approval tomorrow, as well as the survey to the parents who are affected by it, which will ask for your responses no later than Wednesday, so that our <clears throat> administrators can begin the process of assigning staffing, rede redesigning sections. Next week, we go into transportation routing, so that by next Friday, March 12th, uh, our fourth and fifth grade parents will get an updated parent portal notification about a homeroom change, and all of our elementary school parents will have updated information about busing if it applies to them. As I said, the survey will be live for fourth and fifth grade parents tomorrow, more information to other elementary school parents about busing as well. And we should anticipate that um, Assuming the board approves item A3 on tonight's agenda, which will direct the administration to bring back suggestions for how we could bring more middle school students back to school five days a week within the existing guidelines, we may need to do additional surveying of all middle school parents over the next week or two. So just be on the lookout for that. We don't exactly know what that might be or when yet, but we will make sure that that gets out to all middle school parents as soon as it's ready. As always, thank you to everyone who helps make these things happen. This is the same chart that I've put up each time we brought back another group. Um, but it's no less work, significant effort that goes into modeling the scenarios, making sure we have accurate information, thinking about bus routes and classrooms and furniture and space availability, arrival and dismissal procedures and all 
So thank you to our committee chairs, our principals and everybody else for all of their help. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mingle. Um, and just a couple of things to add. Uh, I'm sure some of you are asking about or have questions about the survey that went out after the last board meeting uh, and you know why we're still trying to maintain the social distance. You haven't seen the results of those, uh, but I can tell you it'll be discussed a little bit in the committee reports, but the, over, um, the overall result was that over roughly 70% of people that are currently in school would be okay with the reduction in the guidelines, but we don't need to do it for grades four and five. So therefore we're not going to, we'll be able to bring back all the kids uh, while still maintaining the guidelines, even though most of you, uh, or at least the majority of you are comfortable with, with a reduction in, as, Matt, as Dr. Mingle said, a reduction in what those guidelines are. With respect to the middle school, and that's where it gets a little more complicated. We don't think um, as I mentioned last meeting, a return to school for all students as possible with the existing guidelines, which is why A3 is worded the way it is. The administration will do their best to see how many kids they can get back with the guidelines, but assuming that they can't bring everyone back, they will then have to deliver us a plan that brings everyone back and shows us where we would need to um, um, uh, reduce the protocols. Um, so please keep that in mind as we, as we go on. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mingle. Um, Mrs. Lenhard, the floor is yours for the referendum presentation. Thank you very much, much, Mr. Franco. My name is Pat Lenhard. I'm the business administrator for the Warren Township School District, and I'm go going to just provide an overview of the proposed referendum. And then, uh, the architects from Perez Samjin will provide additional details. The Warren Township School District is in need of capital improvements regarding the maintenance of school facilities and the provision of a health and safe environment for the district's students and staff. If we do this via the way of a referendum which, with voter support, we would receive 34% of the project cost from the state. I'll just explain that quickly because if this does go to the ballots, the ballot will actually say 40% but the state has only funded that budget line in, in its budget at 85%. So therefore the reality is, although we're required by law for the ballot to say 40%, in reality, the district would receive 34% of the project cost. And what are the project costs? You will see over these next two screens, an overview of the 15 projects that would be in this proposed referendum. This is just an overall general listing because the architects will go over each individual project. But the, but the way that we work here in the Warren Township School District is each project is estimated with a low and a high. And when we go out to the referendum, we go out with the high in order to be safe and make sure that we have the funds to finish all of the projects. So the sum total of all of these projects is approximately $8.97 million. But got, circling back around to the um, debt service aid, which is what the 34% is called from the state of New Jersey, the Warren Township School District would be able to couple its capital reserves, which the district has been methodically growing over the last few years. So the $8.97 million worth of projects would be assisted by a little over $3 million from the state, bringing the district's cost to $5.9 million. Due to the level of capital reserves, there would be zero tax impact. These projects cover all five of the district schools and with voter support for a referendum which is proposed to occur on December 14th, the district would only have to pay 66 cents on the dollar for all 15 projects. At this time, I would like to introduce Billy Bannister and Aon from Karat Samjin, who will discuss each of the projects. Thank you, Pat. My name is Billy Bannister. I'm going to be going through a presentation. Pat, I think I need to um, present and share my screen. I I'm going to go through about 16 slides 
it is based on the scope and the timeline and mostly of the scope with the last slide being of the timeline. So bear with me here. You can see that, right? Okay, perfect. So we are proposing a referendum in December of 2021, like, like Pat said, and the agenda items are pretty simple. It's the scope and the timeline. So jumping right into what the scope is for ALT, you'll see here highlighted in red, the windows that are the last remaining windows that, ha that, that need to be replaced within the school. And actually you'll see over here, a set of doors that have been um, a nuisance for the district and, uh, and have outlived their useful life. So these are the windows here as a picture and the windows highlighted here in red are, are, are the ones that we're proposing to kind of bring the entire school up to date with regards to windows. This says over 21, uh, this says over 20 years, they're actually 31 years old. So they're, they're past their useful life. Um, and and um, it looks like a, a replacement would be warranted. Here at, at Central, you'll see this is mostly focused on boilers, pumps, and HVAC. Some of this has been upgraded through the years, um, but some of it is actually over 30 years old. There are four remaining classrooms that do not have air conditioning, and that is the ones in this top right-hand corner of the main floor. Those will get air conditioning. The rest down here will just get heating and ventilation upgrades. And then the, the it, it's kind of hard to see here, but the single dash lines are the pumps and the boilers, and those are the locations of, of those spaces. Here are some pictures of of what that looks like current day. Here you'll see a, a door replacement. So basically what this is, is these doors are of varying ages, as you can see, some of them have been upgraded with hardware. There is about 90 doors that, that look like this and they're in varying condition. This proposes to update all of those with the, with the appropriate fire rating with the appropriate door hardware and all of that to uh, bring these up to be code compliant and um, more up to date. Here you'll see the entire floor plan at the middle school being highlighted. The reason for that is these, these are uh, the lighting that will be retrofitted upgraded from what the existing lighting is to be a more energy efficient LED lighting um, throughout the entire school. Here you'll see the middle school HVAC at the gyms. There's there's actually two RTUs. One is just at 20 years old. One is actually a, a, a little bit older. At one point, cooling was added to it, and we're proposing to replace both of them because um, they, they have outlived their useful lives as well. Science labs at the middle school, there is uh, two types here. Three of these spaces are existing science labs that will be renovated in kind to bring more up-to-date science casework and finishes to the spaces. And then two of them, rooms nine and 10, are actually not currently um, science labs and they will be retrofitted and renovated to accommodate that to make a total of five science labs. Here is woodland boilers. Um, these, are, these have outlived their useful life. They're actually about 35 years old, 25 years old, excuse me. And um, they are, uh, as you can see here in the left pictures. Coming to Woodland Security. So this plan get maybe a, a little confusing, but basically what's changing here is we're actually adding three doors. Two of them are double doors here and here at the end of these hallways. And one of them is a, is a new single door going into the general office. And what we're trying to do is any visitors coming in are, will, will now be out of the weather and in this main lobby where these doors will be permanently locked from the outside, meaning the lobby side. And that individual will be um, kept in here and then greeted by the general office in order to make a, uh, a secure vestibule area so that these doors also will be locked from this side and this side um, with a card swipe with, uh, for access from that side. Here is Woodland Gym HVAC. And again, it's a rooftop unit that has outlived its useful life. 
And here is the fire alarm project that is um, being proposed at, at all of the schools. And there's, there's a bunch of different information with regards to these. There's been a bunch of updates that happened. The last major one happened in, in 2000. There's uh, over the course of, of um, the last four to five years, there's been a, a decent amount of, of expenses for the district to just update some of this. Um, as time goes on, there's new advances in technology that would, um, you know, require additional upgrades to us, to, to these schools and some of these systems. Um, and a newer system could, it, could incorporate some of the newer technologies like an enunciator panel, having an addressable system for the fire department and a bunch of other various upgrades. So that's all of the scopes of the various projects. A very simple timeline starting back in November when we started to review all of these project lists with the district. Uh, we kind of ironed out a lot of the specifics with the facilities team. That brought us all the way through to March where now we're looking to finalize this list so that the board can approve on March 15th. And that gives us about a month, a little bit over a month for PSA to generate all of the appropriate documents to go to the Department of Education with regards to plans and applications and um, then we would, similar to the last referendum, be prepared to have presentations and boards for back to school nights in September for ultimately having the December vote. So from a, from a broad standpoint, that's the, the overview of the scope and the timeline. And that's it. Thank you, Mr. Bannister and Mrs. Lenhart. Uh, just a couple of points of emphasis on that is that as Mrs. Lenhart pointed out, this is a zero tax impact uh, referendum to, to the town. So even if you vote yes, there's no extra money coming out of your pocket. Uh, and that coupled with the fact that you'll hear in a few minutes from our finance committee chair, that um, it is fairly likely that the committee will recommend to the board a budget uh, for next year that uh, has less than a 1% increase. So uh, I think all in all, uh, on a financial note, we're doing quite well. So thank you, Mrs. Lenhardt and Mr. Bannister. I appreciate the presentation. Uh, and it, so now let's uh, discussion amongst the board regarding the referendum. Um, if anyone has questions, you can either just raise your hand so I can see you or raise it on the Zoom feature and, and ask why. Mr. Brzee. Thank you, Mr. Franco, and thank you, PSA, is and Pat for the presentation. So there was mention when, when the LED lights were spoken of, uh, it was noted about their energy efficiency, which I, I would certainly agree with. I was curious, it uh, got me wondering when, when some of the other projects were listed, such as boilers, HVAC, window replacements, is there any sort of um, minimum energy efficiency? Uh, those are all different energy items for a SEER rating, for example, on an AC unit. Is there any minimum energy uh, standard that these need to meet at, if they're part of a, um, a referendum where we receive state money or is it all the same? I'm just curious. So, so based on, on code and, and actually some of the Department of Education standards, we they've set guidelines with regards to sustainability and um, the the efficiencies of the systems that we put in so lead guidelines are are, are a standard which we follow um because it really doesn't in this day and age it doesn't actually cost the district too much more money if, if anything it took to go with a more energy efficient system so I, with the last round of the referendum we actually got a substantial amount of money back um based on some of the programs that the state is is running um so our ex or, so I expect to do something very similar and, and hopefully to get the, those same things back to the district. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Bishi. Got three, three chunks of questions. I'll start out with the most difficult one. Sure. I don't know who, <laughs> I don't know if it's Mr. Bannister, Ms. Ledhart, Dr. Mingle. If I look at all our schools, I, I kind of compare it like to a house, right? So I understand the roof. I understand the boilers, I understand the AC. Do we now, with, with the previous referendum back in, uh, I don't know, like three or four years ago, 
and this one, are we pretty much, we have new furnaces for all the schools and new AC and new roofs, like the kind of brings us to a nice new level. That's a really tough question, I know, because there's probably multiple boilers and multiple schools, but I don't know if we can kind of say the basics, the basic systems are done or not. Can I get that kind of, do you have a feel for whether I can get that comfort? You want me to answer or are you, Pat? So why don't you answer and I'll fill in if I think there's anything so, else. So it's probably would, unfair. I agree. It's tough. I agree. It's a, it's, so it's, it's just based on how much work we put into this, it's actually not as unfair as you think. We So going back three or four years, there was this gigantic binder that, that we made and, and we went through with the with the various teams. And to look back at that binder now, and, and you would be amazed on, on how far we've come over the course of three or four years. And so to answer your question, I, I'm, I'm going to be a little vague, but we, we I don't know that we are at the point where we're completely buttoned up with regards to the systems and, and all of that, but we are we are much closer than we were three to four years ago. I, I think there are still some items that are on the list, but the, but considering you know this is a list of, of 15 projects, I think the last referendum was a list of eight or nine pro, uh, pro, uh, projects. So I, you know think of that uh, of it that way. Over the course of three or four years, we've done 25 various projects that I think really help update these buildings. The only thing I'm going to add that's my concern is some paving needs throughout the district. We have some um, serious paving needs and paving is not a small undertaking. And um, that's something that we have to tackle probably next. Gotcha. And then, and then um, Mr. Bannister, I guess, but it, then I think like doors and science labs are kind of nice to have. So, but I'm thinking if you put those binders together you're pretty comfortable that there's not major boiler or AC or roofing work. Like that, that comes first, right? So Correct. from the point where we're doing doors and science labs, we're pretty comfortable that the basics are covered. Correct. And, and look, so, so uh, you'll always have the occasional random roof leak on a roof that's warranted and, and we'll work with the, with the manufacturer to fix those little things. But generally speaking, that's correct. If there's, if there's older roofs that you know, are past their useful life, we we base our judgments on what the department edu uh, what the department of education issues as the useful life for various components of a building, and obviously Mike Pate does a great job of, of keeping that stuff up yeah. to date. So you know if it says twenty years, maybe it's not always twenty years because it's been so well maintained. So maybe it's longer, but at the same token, that at least goes on the list as something that we need to make sure because this roof could be. You know, maybe it's not in year 21 because Mike's taking care of it, but we should pay attention because it might be year 26. So to answer your question, yes, we're we're keeping an eye on, on all of the various systems and making sure that we're not doing a science lab when there's a roof that's 40 years old. Right, right, right. And then what's softer to me, actually, on the, like the fire alarm systems, I guess, I try to relate it to my simple mind. You replace the control panel. And the sensors, I guess, right? Like you're not rewiring, you're not replacing wiring. No, so unfortunately you are. So in this in this case, we're talking about wiring that's older than you know 2000 and the useful life based on the, the, the Department of Education is, is a 15 year fire alarm system. So look, we all know that fire alarm systems could last based on wiring and electric much longer. The bigger problem comes when the devices themselves start to go and the code based on experiences that happen within the nation progresses. So there are there are new components to buildings that are added, like these HVAC units that now have to have new sensors in them that maybe didn't because it wasn't required when they were installed, and the enunciator panels for the, the for the fire department, and then um, the addressable system. So when the fire department gets there, instead of just saying zone or or floor two has a ha, has an alert it says room 202 has an alert and the fire department knows exactly where to go. So there are, there are a quite a few advances that have happened with regards to fire alarms. And it, 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 it's, it's something that in this case, I would say you're gonna, re, you're gonna be replacing the wiring and all the devices along with all making other things all code compliant. And so I guess you, you're thinking that we need to do the fire alarms more than the paving that Ms. Lenhart, you mentioned, but to me, I can see pavement easier to easier for me to understand that you need a new parking lot. I guess the fire alarm needs replacing more than the parking lot. Well, another factor, 
that plays into it is that parking lots, generally speaking, are not eligible for debt service aid. And this entire referendum would be eligible for the 34%. Perfect. Excellent. I got it. But, uh, but the parking, they're kind of on the same thing, Mr. Bannister, same level, like we need a parking lot as much as we need a fire? Um, yes. I, I think okay. so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think they, they, they yes. I, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. And then in your experience, uh, moving on to the second question, um, I know I get, I think I might be able to get a rebate from like PSE&G if I replace my furnace or air conditioner and it's energy efficient. Um, I think in Detroit, the utility will actually come to your house and replace all the light bulbs with LED bulbs for free. So can we get any kind of efficiency rebates from the utility or free LED bulbs from somebody? Mr. Breezy kind of talked about sustainability, but um, financially, can we get anything? So for the last 2019 referendum, I believe we got $72,000 back, Pat, in grant um, rebates. So that were a direct, um, a, it was directly from the boilers being more efficient. And trust me when I tell you, it was not an easy thing to do for us to get that stuff. We had to, <laughs> we had to send out all of these various, various applications that get the contractor to help us. But yeah, there are programs and we will exhaust every one of those programs for, for you because it, it's in your best interest. I'd like to add that on Friday, the clean energy program is coming back out to the district because we're eligible for $40,000 for the um, HVAC work that we did at Central at ALT. Oh, so, and so, yeah, what I was thinking, tell me if I'm right, that's kind of gravy. Uh, that's a pleasant surprise in the future that we're not relying on within this referendum. If we do get that rebate in the future, it'll just be a pleasant surprise. It's not with exactly, numbers. We're exactly, not because the state changes their programs. And for me to sit here and, and commit you to getting, a, getting some allocation of money based on what the state is doing, I'm not comfortable with that. I, no, gotcha. I'd rather it just be gravy, like you said. So let me ask you this, uh, on the same uh, line of thinking, uh, can we, so you know how we're getting COVID money? I guess we have to apply for a grant for COVID money. Uh, and then I think what the Washington allocated was 13 million in the first COVID package, 130 bi billion, I'm losing track now, billion in the second package, right? So there's a lot of COVID money sloshing around can any can windows that open or HVAC that has COVID level filtration qualify for COVID funds? So the all of the exact specifics about the second round of the CARES Act or or, or uh, the 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 ESSER funds um, are not exactly ironed out completely. It was actually only about a week and a half ago that. That, it, that we found out that it was funded. And we're actually in the process of trying to figure out exactly what that means, because we, I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure yet. We are, we are, as a company, focused on that, but we haven't gotten the exact specifics of, of what that means for you and, and how we get that money for you. The other thing we have so to be careful of is when you're taking 34% from the state, you have to be careful that you're not using federal funds to pay the local share. There's, there's very strict rules about not co-mingling of all these grants. Gotcha. But based on your answer, I'm thinking that would also be a pleasant surprise if we were able to get, sure. we would get that COVID money is subject to all that complexity. Ms. Yeah. Lampart, we there's a possibility that we might be able to offset some of the cost with COVID money. Yes, but I have to be really careful with referendum. Yeah. The other thing too is referendums take a long time to implement, right? This, this referendum, which is slated for vote in December of 21 will probably be going on until 24, I would say, right, Mr. Bannister? Yep, that's correct. Gotcha. And just to confirm, Ms. Lenhart, that the what's in the presentation for capital reserve, that's already reserved for? That it, will, it will be on June 30th. Okay, gotcha. So nothing about the new, next year's budget that, that's a whole, yeah, gotcha. All right, thank you. Sorry to take up so much of your time. Thanks, Mr. Bishi. Good questions. Anybody else? Mr. Brzee? Sorry, a couple of follow-ups. Uh, thank you. So regarding the, the fire alarms, it looked like there was you know, quite a big chunk and I don't want to come across as fire alarms aren't important. I have four kids in the schools, so uh, they are important. Um, our current fire alarms, are they 
lacking? Are they not functional? Do they not work? Are there issues? I'm trying to go back to the reason why they need down to copper wire getting replaced in all the buildings that I've always learned copper is copper, but I'm not a fire alarm expert either. So I could answer that in um, various different parts. So what I could go by what I know from your facilities team and over the course of four to five years, you've spent about $100,000 on upgrades and updates and replacements of the various heads that have no longer um, worked. The wiring that has either been spliced or, or, or um, was no longer working for whatever various reason. And um, that those items needed to be replaced. So that's kind of one chunk. And then what we've been seeing through the um, various years is, is your, your township has been coming to inspect. And, and as time goes on, they're, they're finding more things to identify as needing to be upgraded. So I, I believe that, that that pattern would likely minimally stay the same and you know, if not get worse. And then there are other things that at some point they're gonna require you to do. Your, your, your front end at some of the schools are, is maxed out. So if somebody comes in and says, you, know, you have to add this many new devices, you, you, you technically can't. So, then you're, so now you're replacing the head end and all of that. Um, so th there's a bunch of little various different components to this and reasons why you know, it's on the list. So that's just some of them. Um, I, I think that that answers. I, I, no, it, it does and I appreciate that, thank you. And another question I had actually touched on a little bit was the inspection aspect of it. So um, I know locally in the area, commercial buildings, you know, the local fire inspector comes you know, from the town um, is, is there anything different for schools? Do we have to have like an independent outside agency or is that the, that's the, oh, it's that inspection that, yep. okay. Yeah. And if I could, um, I have one more question, hopefully that's it. So, um, Mrs. Leonard mentioned the timeline, meaning this could go through estimated 2024. And I, I totally get that's just, that's where we are based on what we know now. Is there any financial incentive or penalty if it comes if it finishes earlier if it goes past 2024 is there anything from a financial and I'm for financial meaning taxpayer uh, perspective that would impact this later on or no so actually changes? the way that the state debt service aid works and um, I think if you've noted when I speak about the bond referendum I always speak about a note rather than a bond and that's because the note is less than a year in maturity. So the plan would be that we would sell in July of 22 and repay in July of 23. And then the caveat is the monies are ours to manage, but by law, since we went to the voters for approval, we must finish all the projects at an expense no higher than what we borrowed. You can't supplement even if you have additional monies unless you go back to the voters and ask them for approval to spend more money. So the caveat is to try to get this work done within the dollar amount, it doesn't behoove you to be five years out. Okay, thank you, that makes sense, thank you. Okay, any other questions on the referendum from board members? Seeing none, uh, thank you guys very much. Mr. Bannister, we appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on, oh, Mrs. Lenhart. Oh, you were just waving. Okay. Um, moving on to committee reports. Um, Mr. Brzee, would you like to start? I didn't even get to raise my hand. I certainly would. The Finance Operations and Secure Security Committee met on Thursday, February 25th. Uh, just a note to the board, this agenda was included in Dr. Mingle's update on 225 to the board to allow us to follow the norms and of course have a readout uh, on tonight. Um, so items that we discussed included a proposed change to dental insurance. There is no financial district benefit no financial benefit to the district with this. It does look like it would be uh, a benefit to our employees who are on this dental plan in the form of a, you know, a very slight lower premium that they would have to pay out of pocket. 
The buildings and grounds roof bid. Uh, during the process of this, there was minor asbestos found that required a removal. This was added as an ad alternate to the existing process. We reviewed all the bids. Long story short, on tonight's agenda, B3, you will see if there's actual uh, uh, a motion to reject all the bids due to them being uh, over the budgeted amount. So that's where we are with that at the moment. Regionalization, uh, Mr. Franco gave us a brief update uh, regarding regionalization uh, that was been discussed at the Watchung Hills uh, level and I believe the new business tonight, Mr. Franco will have more to share with the board on that. Capital projects were discussed. So uh, as Mr. Bannister referred to earlier as the giant binder, that's exactly what this is. This is going through a, um, a, a list that you can't even imagine how long this is. Um, but, but what I do want to mention regardless is uh, essentially what was echoed earlier is the progress we have made to this. And that's due to the credit of administration and, you know, Mr. Pate, who's on and his team and just chewing through this as much as we possibly can with the funds that we have. So credit to them for that. We, we did a, a full review of that where we were as well as the funding to the capital improvement uh, plan and, you know, where we are with that which of course led us to the budget uh, from a uh, perspective for 2021-2022. Um, one of the reasons why we met on the 25th was that was the date that the state aid would, was released. Uh, Warren Township received an increase of $307,386 to the state aid. That alone brought our tax levy down to 1.18% and created additional bank cap. Um, discussing the budget further with the committee, uh, we further recommended removing the additional, um, the budgeted $100,000 to capital improvement based on um, um, analysis of where we currently are and what we've been putting to capital reserve which brings our tax levy down further to 0.94%. As Mr. Franco indicated earlier, we are under 1% with that. Um, we, we made no decision, but there was additional discussion beyond that to see if there was appetite for um, pre-purchasing fund 12 items for this year's budget, taking them out of next year's budget to reduce it further. But again, no, uh, no recommendation was, was there for that. Um, so as it currently stands, the budget is at 0.94% tax increase. Uh, the next Finance Operation Security Committee meeting is currently scheduled for Monday, March 8th at 6 p.m. I believe that is all I have, Mr. Franco. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brzee. Other committee reports, Mrs. Zone. Uh, yes, the Personnel Committee met February 16th. Uh, it was a fairly short meeting. We went over for informational purposes an updated job description for the assistant principal supervisor of the summer fund program. Um, additionally, the and if you go to the um, minutes for that meeting, you're going to find the schedule for the superintendent uh, evaluation timeline as well as the board self evaluation timeline. Um, both of those begin in June, so. Uh, more information about what that looks like will be circulated as we get closer to those dates, um, but you can find the timelines attached to the personnel committee minutes. Um, we briefly discussed um, some public information with regard to median salaries uh, of the district for our teaching staff as compares to other districts and just reminded the existing newly constituted personnel committee of outstanding negotiation items that um, carried over from the previous committee. And that's all. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Owen. Mr. Mingle? Yes, the ad hoc return to school committee met last Wednesday. Uh, Mr. Franco already shared the, 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 the kind of highlight which led to the recommendation for item A3 on the agenda tonight related to middle school planning. We also reviewed the planning that was underway at that time for grade three and middle school self-contained special education, which is hybrid 1.2 that went into effect today. We reviewed the proposal for fourth and fifth grade, which is on the agenda tonight and you heard about earlier. Uh, and then we talked just kind of about workflow in general. We looked into some extensive research on the physical distancing guidelines and middle school options, which as I said, led to the A3 recommendation. And then just some quick uh, updates Around, that there is a proposal being developed for spring sports at the middle school. 
We gave some information about after school activities that ran in the winter and are continuing in the spring across all five schools. Um, and I think that's it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mingle. Any other committee reports? I don't think there are any. Okay, moving on to our first set of public commentary. This is for agenda items only. Uh, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. I will call on you in the order in which you raise your hand. You'll have three minutes um, to make your comments. Please turn on your camera, uh, if I didn't already say that. Mrs. Lenhart, do we have any written questions? We do not, Mr. Franco. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fallon. Good evening. Uh, my name is Peter Fallon. I live at 18 Gregory Lane. I'm a former member of your board, but many, many years ago, when some of those rooftop units that Mr. Bannister was referring to were installed. Uh, I'm currently a member of the Watchung Hills Regional High School Board of Education. And I wanted to take this opportunity to commend Dr. Mingle, uh, Mrs. Lenhart, and all of the members of your Board of Education for your approach to this referendum and note project. Uh, it, the same, same approach we used at the high school for our last two referendums, but you're all to be commended for having had the foresight to put the money into, into capital reserve over the last few years so that you're able to pay the local portion without increasing the tax levy. And I just want to say I'm, I'm proud of the way you're doing that and, and you guys should be proud of yourselves for doing that too. And we'll be supporting you in December. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fallon, appreciate it. Any other public commentary? Okay, seeing none, um, let's move on to agenda items. Are there any agenda items that any board members would like to have pulled for discussion or separate vote? Mr. Brzee. I, I would like, can I pull C7 for a separate vote? I, in transparency, I did not do my homework in time and I unfairly sent questions um, late. And Dr. Mingle probably hasn't even seen them yet uh, in transparency because it was right before this meeting. So I just don't have enough information to support that. Okay. Thank you. Let's see, seven, any other agenda items for discussion or separate vote? Mr. Bishi? Uh, so, on D1, on the policy changes, I just had a global question. Um, I, I would like to post them to our public website so that the public can actually see the policies that we're proposing to be changed. And I think if it's available from Strauss Esme, I guess the service that doesn't present a problem, but so I, I think what I'd like to just ask is, does it present a problem? Like, I don't know if, if we should be disclosing possible changes to our policies. Um, well, the reason I'd like to do it is because I'd like to just allow the public to say, okay, I see what you're changing and I have commentary on it. But I don't know if that's legally okay. And so I don't know if maybe I just want to ask if administration can see if that, I, I, there's another district in New Jersey that does do it, and I saw it on their website, so I think it's okay, but I just don't wanna propose anything that might in any way not be kosher. It's, it's definitely okay. It's public information, people can request it. So yes, that's not, there's no legal issue with posting it. The only part of it I don't know about would be the, the summary from Strauss Esme. I don't know if that's proprietary, but the policies themselves are the boards once you take them. So that's up to the board. Oh, okay. Um, if I wanted to um, make a motion to do that, do I do that within? Make it now. Or make the motion. Uh, motion to uh, put on our public website proposed changes to our policies sans the 
the policy alert that stress may provides. Do you want the policy or do you just want the policies in full on the website? No, so the policies in full as approved by the board are already there, but I maybe to be more specific. When a first reading of proposed changes to our policies are in our agenda, I would like those proposed policy changes to be available to the public on our public website. Yeah, fair enough. I'll second that, Brzee. Mr. Bellish. Yes. Mr. Bishi. Yes. Mr. Brzee. You're muted, David, but he seconded us. Yes, I'm sorry, yes. Mrs. Clark. Yes. Ms. DiMaggio. Yes. Ms. Keller. Yes. Mr. Weinstein? Yes. Mrs. Zahn? Yes. And Mr. Franco? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. So uh, C7, Mr. Brzee, do you want to address? A, a separate vote I, I, is all. I just don't have what I would need to feel comfortable. That's all. So. Okay. Mr. Bishi, if you would. Sorry, Mr. Franco, just one more question. If I had a comment on one of the policies in that 127 page document, um, there's one that says if th they're changing the requirement for a vendor of ours to, um, if, if we're spending, if we're giving a, <laughs> Ms. Lenhardt, correct me if I'm wrong, but if we are, spending money on a vendor above 17,500, then they have to fill out a political contribution disclosure form. And now the change to the policy is that only for-profit entities have to fill this out. So to me, that uh, is kind of interesting. Like if you're a not-for-profit entity, I don't know who they may be, Ms. Lenhart, but I think you should be held to the same standards as for-profit entities in disclosing your political, whatever it is that this form is. So I just don't know though, if we have a lot of those type of vendors, Ms. Lenhart, and that might, they might just say, you know, there's a hundred page, a ridiculously complex form to fill out. And then all of a sudden we don't have access to some of these not-for-profit vendors because they're like, forget it. It's unreasonable. I'm not going to do it. So I just don't know how many, if that's a lot of a population of vendors. So generally speaking, I'm going to say that 98% of our vendor relationships are for-profit and the outliers are non-for-profit non out-of-district placements. So this is probably a nod to not requiring private schools for the disabled, some of which are non-profit, okay. not having to require a PCD. A PCD also is not that onerous. I'm not sure why this was worth someone's time. It's, it's, it's not an onerous document. Okay. So if I were to want to keep it for every, everyone should fill out this form. That's not something that we act on tonight because this is just the first reading, right? No, if you, if you have, if you want to make changes to the policy or if you want to make, have, make a proposal to change the language in the policy, you do that now. All right. So I would just propose that we do not limit the completion of a political contribution disclosure form to for profit, I think we should require that. Can you, can you specify which policy you're referring to? Uh, policy, oh man. Uh, it's on I think it's 6360, if I'm not mistaken. P6360. And then whatever motion he's making, right? Excuse I me, would Dr. Just be, Mangle? Yeah, I would just want to add um, if we're, so our process has been that if we're doing something different than what Strauss Esme recommends, I would get legal guidance for the board. So I would say, I don't know that you need a motion necessarily. Well, let's just take that off the okay. approval list. We can table that one piece and I can get you guidance and then you can decide what to do with it at the next meeting. So, so uh, policy number 6360 will move off of the agenda. It will not be approved with the rest of them. So Mark, in your um, preamble on the approvals for items, items for board consideration, just remove that in the motion. Just say item D1 less P6360. That's all. 6360. Okay. 
All right. Um, uh, I'm ready to go if everybody, all right. Sure. Uh, motion to approve uh, agenda item uh, 12, items A1 through A3, B1 through B3, C1 through C6 and C8, and then uh, D1 except for uh, proposed policy 6360. Yes. Uh, I'll second. Thank you. Mr. Ballish. Yes. Mr. Bishi. Yes. Mr. Brzee. Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Clark. Yes. Mrs. DiMaggio. Yes. Ms. Keller. Yes. Mr. Weinstein. Yes. Mrs. Zahn. Yes. And Mr. Franco. Yes. Motions carry. And then motion to approve uh, item 12, number C7. Second by DiMaggio. Do I have a second? DiMaggio. Thank you, Mrs. DiMaggio. Mr. Bellish. Yes. Mr. Bishi. Yes. Mr. Brzee. Abstain. Mrs. Clark. Yes. Mrs. DiMaggio. Yes. Ms. Ms. Keller. Yes. Mr. Weinstein. Yes. Mrs. Zahn. Yes. And Mr. Franco. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Moving on to unfinished business. Do we have any unfinished business? Seeing none, uh, new business, the regionalization study request, Mr. Bishi, if yes, you would thank mind you. giving us an update. I will, uh, do, and then Mr. Franco, maybe you could fill in. Yeah. And forget. So Mr. Franco and I talked to um, Washington Hills Regional High School board members, uh, Bob Morrison and uh, Greg Shabilsky regarding uh, applying to the state for a study on regionalizing our district with the high school and the other three sending districts to the high school. So this would be Wa the high school, Warren, Greenbrook, Wachong, and Long Hill. So going from five to one, the state offers to pay for the study but we have to apply. I think they estimated the cost might be 90 to 150,000. Um, there's no obligation to regionalize, but there is the obligation to publish the results of the study. Um, they were very uh, helpful. They provided a lot of information to us um, and they kind of broke down the benefits uh, for cost and for curriculum. So the, you would think everybody, and, and this is, you know, the state offering to pay for it. So the state obviously is kind of uh, characterizing this as a potential cost savings. Um, it was interesting to me in all the documents that uh, Mr. Morrison provided to us, it's very historical. There was one most recent one that was done um, in so South Hunterdon with less than a thousand students. There's two more being done in central New Jersey right now as we speak. Um, all less than, a, very much smaller districts than even Warren. Um, and they provided all these historical, even older reports, the majority of which did not come out with the cost savings. So I was very surprised because I kind of thought it would be the case because that's what the state's kind of pushing it for. Um, but these were older reports. Um, the curriculum benefits are more difficult than, for me to kind of um, articulate or even glean from all of the documents that they provided to us. Um, you know, in the South Hunterdon study, I think they said, oh, well, now we could finally hire a curriculum director. And I'm thinking, well, we already got one here. Like, it, these are really small districts. So I'm not sure how to quantify the benefit of the curriculum. Um, so to me, there's not much downside for, I guess, participating in the study, but it's due by June 30th. So we would then be listening to consult possible consultants, kind of doing a beauty pageant of these guys, presenting to our board, who's the best consultant. We'd have to um, apply by June 30th. 
And then we're gonna get the information requests. So Dr. Mangle, Ms. Lenhard, you're gonna to have to fill out all this information to the state. So there's a lot of work at a time that we're very busy with other things, right? Um, if it weren't for that, there might not be that much downside. Um, but you know, just because the state's paying for it doesn't mean that we should do it if we're not thinking that consolidation makes sense for us. So observations that I had that would really be much more specific in this report, but just to get them out there for consideration by the board is um, we spend the most per student than all of those other districts. All right, so that's one thought. I don't know what our ratables are, you know, Warren Township tax base versus all these other townships, but if we have more of a tax base, maybe our taxes go up. Uh, uh, there's other issues where the um, district with the most students uh, kind of uh, sets like the salary guide for teachers. So the district with the most students is Wachong Hills Regional High School with 2,076. We're the second runner up with 1749 and then Long Hill, Greenbrook and Wachong are at 853, 844 and 685. But they'd be kind of running the show. Um, state aid would change. Um, and then what kind of came to my mind's eye was last board meeting when we went till 1130. Uh, if that were a regional district, that community conversation would have gone till sunrise, right? And, and the answer is it wouldn't go to sunrise, right? So in terms of our community voice, we would, as we do currently, we have three members on the high school board. So we'd be down to probably three members on a much bigger board and have a less, just less say in the matter. And that's hard to quantify, but. Four. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, she's saying four. We have four. Uh, four uh, Warren, Warren has four representatives on the high school board, not three, four. Bill Skeef, ah, that's right. Um, so that's, it. that's the only kind of things where if we're, if we wouldn't want to do it, then why, um, why even go along with you know the submission? But kind of like if the state's paying for it, um, you know, not paying for it, why not? Let me let me read you this though. At the end of the school board's um, article, it says studies into the feasibility of establishing a countywide school district or a K through 12 regional district incorporated any regional high school automatically receives preliminary approval. So although you're applying for a grant, we're pretty much gonna get it, right? They'll, they'll say we can do the study. It's not like we would be rejected. And here's what's interesting. It says the legislation would permit regionalization studies to be undertaken without a formal vote by all sending districts to participate. In these cases, the regionalization study would include an option for the merger of just the officially participating districts and a second option for full regionalization that would also include sending districts not signing a participation letter that might choose to join the newly created regional district after seeing the study results. So if we don't participate in the study and then we see the study and say, oh, I'd rather, well, then only the districts signing the participation letters would be eligible for a reduction in their state aid. So the state's kind of saying, we're not going to um, take away the benefit of any state aid um, if, if it winds up that, you know, you would otherwise receive less state aid. If you participate in the study, we're gonna keep your state aid as is. I think we might be getting a little too granular. So that's actually, that was it, Mr. Franco. Yeah. That was no, I mean, just, just a couple of points from my side, because, you know, Mark and I attended the meeting together. Uh, first of all, this was driven by the Washington Hills Regional Board, not by us. We did not ask uh, for this. So it's not like we're driving the ship here. Um, and what we're talking about here really is just the study, not necessarily regionalization itself. So just keep that in mind. We're not actually talking about merging districts. We're talking about whether or not we want to participate in the study itself. Um, so from my perspective, if the state is paying for the study, 
whether or not we have any interest, and I'm going to tell you personally, I have no interest in a regionalization of Warren Township schools. Um, but um, it would be we would be remiss to not be involved in the process, because otherwise the process will be controlled by um, the regional board as well as the boards of the other sending districts. So if we get ourselves involved, we then would contribute members to a committee that would then be part of this regionalization reporting process. Um, the other thing that concerns me, as Mr. Bishi said, was how much time will it take for our administration to do this? I think, and as I mentioned um, on our phone call uh, or Zoom meeting, that if it takes one minute right now away from um, Dr. Mingle and his team, I'm not for it. Uh, simply because we just don't have the time to spare right now. So I had asked some questions about timing of it, when you would actually need to commence the reporting and how much work needs to be done from our administration. I don't know that all those questions have been answered. Um, so, I mean, that it is really just the report that we're talking about here. It's nothing beyond that. And even if we part choose to participate in the report, we have no obligation to participate in the regionalization. That would then be uh, a voter referendum by the town uh, once once you got to that point. So I think I've covered it. I'm pretty sure Mr. Fallon will, will chime in on something uh, during public commentary. But I think um, I think from from our conversation, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, board questions, Mrs. Ms. Keller. Uh, I thought I had read that there was some benefit that doing the study would actually give us some more updated information about the demographics. Was that another positive of doing it? Yeah. You, okay. You'll, you'll wind up getting way more information than you have now about okay. the demographics, uh, not only of our district, but of the, of the other districts as well. And another point to add is uh, in some of the materials that, um, that were shared with us, they had our budget numbers wrong. So while well, they had us at such a huge per student figure that they, they were including, it seems, the referendum figures, uh, the other $6 million or whatever it is on top of the budget number. So they really skewed the numbers uh, uh, against us. So that just needs to be corrected. But any other questions, Mr. Brzee? Do we, thank you, uh, Mr. Franco. So we mentioned being part of this study. Do we know what included in the study and demographics was just mentioned but what what else are we and i realize it's it's state money but i'm still sensitive the state gets its money from somewhere it gets it from us right so i we're just voting to spend less of our money versus more of our money if it was at a local level so i'm, I'm still well, uh I, hesitant I from that, that aspect i would uh mr busy i would tell you that is whether we choose to participate or not this report is going to happen that's fair. Do, um, do we know like the, the company or companies that do the report, are they also magically the companies that can turn around and help you implement like the, the, the consulting gig kind of thing? These are all things that we, that we asked. Um, there seem to be a handful of qualified consultants within the state that are capable of doing this. That is something that our members of whoever we contribute to this new ad hoc committee between all the districts would be involved in selecting. So no one has been selected to do the report yet. This is something if we chose to participate, we would have a say in uh, and say in who that is. Uh, as far as, as far as, sorry, what was your other question about uh, what information? What's in the study, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know 100%. I mean, Mr. Bishi's reviewed a couple of them. Maybe he can, can speak to them, but I, I, I I'm sorry, before I let you speak, Mr. Beach, I think one of the key things that we're being told from the members of the Watching Hills Regional Board is that the, they see the biggest advantage being on the curriculum side, that they, they see a discrepancy between the curriculum between perhaps our district and some of the other districts, and they think that this would be a way to level that out. Um, and I don't know what that means exactly, but that's, that's I, 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 perception. That's, yeah, and that's good to know. I've always thought that we were pretty high when I, I personally compare that's to right. others, but uh, so hopefully that's not a detriment to Warren being penalized for being a little bit ahead. That would be- that, That's my, that's one that of my- would not be, good. That's one of my concerns, yeah. Mr. Bishi, anything to add? Uh, 
so I may have said this or may have not, I guess it's a matter of, you know, is it going to lift all boats or is it going to go to the lowest common denominator to be very crass, right? I mean, that's the question. In a regionalized school district, uh, is, that, is this going to be beneficial or are you going to kind of, you know, you're going to go to the lowest common denominator? I hate to put it so bluntly, but that's but the question to me, that's because you know what you, you ask about who these consultants will be. I, I saw the consultants coming to the board meeting, but Mr. Franco, I think that's more accurate. Probably it would just go to like the committee among the, the districts in reading the reports that they had provided. Uh, I don't, how can you ever, I don't know how a consultant can say, okay, five years from now, you know, your kids are going to be doing better or worse. That's some, I don't know how a consultant can say that. They can say you'll be able to get a curriculum director or something like that, but to actually commit to say that your test scores are going to go up, I just, you know, I don't know how they can do that. Mrs. Zone. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to see all the boards uh, resist the urge to guess what this study might reveal. Um, <laughs> I, I read the South Hunterdon report. Um, so, I mean, I have a general idea of what potentially a report like this could look like and the kind of demographic information that might be in it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we are nothing like South Hunterdon. This district, uh, the five districts here are nothing like any of the other uh, consolidated regionalized districts that I've seen. We're larger, um, we're operational, all of us. And so I don't, I don't know what a study like this would look like, and I'd like to resist trying to guess, and I'd like to encourage the high school district to not do that either. Um, I've watched the videos at their meetings. I watched Wachung's video from last week where um, Mr. Jabolski and Mr. Morrison also attended there and spoke to their um, board. And um, I, I just, I don't want anyone, I, it, it's a little uncomfortable. I admit that the high school board almost seems sometimes when they speak of regionalization to have come to the conclusion that it would be a good thing. And I don't know that anyone should be coming to any conclusions yeah. at all. They, they, they definitely spoke with a positive spin. That's and that's fine. You can be positive about undertaking the process, but I think that to proceed in this, with this process with all of us, you know, bearing in mind who, who our constituents are, who it is we're trying to, you know, what our job is and, and doing that in a responsible way means that we have to, if we're going to, go down this path, we do it without any assumptions about what the outcome might look like. My biggest concern, frankly, is timing. Um, it, it's, it's not that I wouldn't be willing to support participating in a very equal way with the other boards that would be affected by this, not with any one particular board leading, but all five boards looking at whether or not there's a way to do this cooperatively. I wouldn't be averse to that if we weren't so gosh darn busy. Um, you know, it's 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 tough timing, and this is if done right. I, I don't think this is something you 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 do in a haphazard way. I think that this requires a commitment from all five of the boards, personnel commitment, um, you know, uh, intellectual commitment, uh, a willingness to rigorously look at this and and. You know, ex I would expect a report at the minimum would come back with half a dozen different scenarios, which would then have to be evaluated um, and and discussed. And um, this is this is a process that, from soup to nuts, seems like it would take some time. I don't know that we need to start that clock now, in the middle of a pandemic when we are trying to get all of our students back in school and we are leaning heavily on our administration. To make that happen, I think and, the timing is and we're looking at a referendum in in eight months. This is on. I think the timing is being forced by the deadline on the submission in order to get the state funds. Well, if somebody, that's, if, that's, you know, I'm just telling you that's that's why I agree with you. I'm just telling you that that's the pressure. That's why the date, the that's where the pressure is coming from on the date. It's coming from the deadline to submit to get the state funds. I can't be. I don't feel driven by that. I, I got to think that the state, if they're really interested in encouraging districts in the state to pursue regionalization studies, are going to know that now for many no, of us, not it's not the greatest time to do that. Um, I, I would, I would be very, I, I would be willing to revisit this, of course. Yeah. 
I'm just not feeling like, to, I, is there an ask of us? I mean, thank you for all right, that. Not today. Yeah, so there's nothing we need to do other than just oh, kind of do what we can. There will, be an ask in, there will be an ask in the future, but right now it's just a discussion topic. Okay. Mr. Weinstein. Yeah, I, I think a couple things. First, uh, if there's a document, Mr. Franco, Mr. Bishi, or, or resources you can direct us to, I would love to get smarter on this topic. Uh, in all honesty, I'm not. Um, but, but in hearing what everyone's saying, I think there's an opportunity cost to echo Mrs. Zahn's statement and sentiment that we really need to consider. If this takes time and resources away from the number one goal, which is to get as many kids back in school as possible, I think we really need to think long and hard about whether this is worth it or not. Um, without seeing the documentation that hopefully you all are able to provide, I would say that this is not worth it and the timing actually could not be worse. Um, because we need every single resource possible to get every single kid back in school K through eight. That's right. I agree. Uh, Ms. Clark, you're muted. You're still on mute. Ms. Clark, you're still on mute. There you Sorry. Go. Uh <laughs> I was wondering what the timing was on this. If you're going to go through all this, what's the anticipation of what, when the outcome would happen? I'm assuming this is years down the line, potentially. Well, that's, the, I don't know that I have an answer to that. Okay. I can. Mrs. Zong? Well, I can just say that when South Hunterdon undertook this process, lots and lots of talk, long, long, long years, but when they actually undertook the process and decided yes, for real, they did it pretty fast. Uh, I think I think like a year and a half, they turned around, put it out for a vote and made it happen. But we're not South Hunterdon. No. And not at all, even close to the same situation that they had uh, at, in any way that I could see. I saw no commonalities whatsoever. So, but I, I mean, at least in theory. Mm -hmm. Ms. Keller? So I just want to confirm that it's a June deadline for, uh, for the application, but we don't have clarity on when the actual work against the study would happen, or do you have that? I, I don't have clarity on that, but that's okay. my understanding is that that June is the deadline for the application. Okay. Funds. And so we would have to decide whether or not we want to participate and be part of the process or, or not. But I think this is happening either way. And so it's going to be a question of whether or not we want to participate. Do you know if we can make anything contingent on the timing? Like we want to do this and we want to apply now, but we don't want to start it until February of next year. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a question, it's a question we can ask. Okay. And, and has been asked. Okay. But, I figured. <laughs> and I think that's fair, right? I can't imagine we're the only district having this conversation about bad timing. It's not as if one district is less or more affected by the pandemic. We all are. But the timing, like I said, I don't think could be any worse based on what our central goal is. And that's getting kids back in school. Right. All right. Mr. Bishi. There's one last clarification in the New Jersey uh, School Boards Association article I was reading from. They said the, the wording of the legislation that Sweeney's proposing is not yet available. So I don't know when that becomes available, but when I got that, I asked Mr. Morrison, is there any flexibility on the June application date? And he said, no. So I did kind of think that through on the timing. And then Mr. Breezy, something you said about the consultant, I just wanted to also let you know, they uh, thought that this would be a consultant from within New Jersey, one of which is the a, a former, uh, the, the head of the, years ago because New Jersey is so unique. So you're not going to get a consultant out of Ohio or wherever, Kentucky or California. It's a limited pool of potential consultants because New Jersey is so unique. So I got to imagine all those guys are going to be pretty gosh darn busy with doing studies as well. So there's that, you know, uh, timing constraint as well. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. They're from New Jersey. I'm sure they know people quite well. Yeah. Okay, um, so just think about that. I'm sure it'll come up again. And uh, so anybody else before I move on? Okay, uh, moving on to public commentary. This is the second public commentary of the meeting uh, on any topic whatsoever. Please use the raise your hand feature 
You'll have three minutes. Please state your name and address. Um, okay, Mr. Fallon, you're up first. Hey, good evening, same address. Uh, I wanna thank you all for your consideration of, of this request. I, I wanna just make a couple points for you just to take for your further consideration when, if and when this comes up again. We're not in a situation where the board members at Watch on Hills have decided that, that we wanna you know, pursue regionalization. We're, in, we're interested in getting information about what regionalization would look like. Uh, as Ms. Zahn pointed out, there's likely to be a very variety of different scenarios that'll get examined. And each town is gonna have their own considerations as to whether or not it makes sense. To, to Mr. Bishi's point, the whole point of this is to get information and, and the board members of Watch on Hills have not made a commitment to, re, uh, to regionalization. And you know a number of them have just as many questions as you people have about whether or not it makes sense for the high school, just as you have questions as to whether it makes sense for the township. The, I can tell you that you know having been both on your board for two terms and, and now on the high school board in my, my fifth term. In terms of, of curriculum advantages, one of the things that, that we deal with is articulation. And, and we get eighth graders from four different towns and they, they don't always come to us with the same level of experience in, in every subject. We've made great strides in the last few years and Warren Township has been a great partner in helping work with our teachers to, to, to get the articulation so that, that your students are close to where we need them to be when, when we take over and we educate all of the ninth graders from the four towns. But with the four districts, we sometimes have to cajole and ask. And sometimes just like now with getting kids back into school, you have other priorities. It, it doesn't always take take place in a way that that you know benefits the kids the most would be my personal opinion. So that is one area where regionalization might hold promises of improving the curriculum because at that point all of the ninth graders from all four towns would be getting to us with the same experience in the four towns and we're not wasting high school time bringing some of them back up to the same point that you've got them at or that Greenbrook has them at, et cetera. I just, second, Mr. Fallon. I'm sorry, Mr. Frank. You only have a few seconds left, please. Okay. I, ju I just wanna very quickly address the, the issue of timing. It's our expectation with these, with this June application deadline that we're not gonna, that whatever committee is gonna be put together isn't gonna be interviewing people to do these reports until well o over the summer and, and possibly in the fall. And it's unlikely that a, a, a consultant will be chosen before the fall. Mm -hmm. And that means that the, the report's gonna, the, the time you. pressure is not gonna be within the next few months. Uh, okay. I'll stop That's there, true. Mr. Franco. Thank if you, appreciate it. Address that further, I can at another time. Okay, uh, Mr. Pucci. Yes, thank you. With Mark Pucci, 33 Washington Valley Road. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all the staff who I know have been working very, very hard over, geez, a better part of, you know, at least a half a year. I'd also like to thank the board. Had they not asked the Warren Middle School polling question, we'd even be further away from getting Warren Middle School back to full day in-person schooling. At the same time, this is a little bit scary to me. All it took was a simple question. So I'm a little bit conflicted on that. Um, here's what I heard today. 70% of middle school parents are okay with less than six feet. I think 20% were full remote. So this means about 10% on the fence. So in as little words as possible, really- I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Pucci, that is, that's not correct. Like I'll, I'll, I'll okay. clarify that for you. I don't want this counting as my three minutes though. No, no, go ahead. No, sorry, go ahead, finish. So the 70%, the, the 72% the was from kids that are currently in hybrid A or B. So those are the kids that are currently going to school. That does not include the kids that are already fully remote. Oh, okay. Thank you for that clarification. That I wasn't 
for whatever reason, I didn't receive that message. So thank you for that. Um, that's helpful. Um, second, I would like to say I am a little bit concerned that here we are, what is this, 104 minutes into the board meeting and literally only one minute was spent on getting the kids back to full-time school, which to me is unequivocally the sole agenda item that should be on every single board meeting from now until it gets done. So I just don't understand how this is not the focus. This is very confusing. And lastly, in late July, parents specifically asked what the binding constraints were on getting kids back to school. Six foot social distancing was one of them for every single school. And while I'm thrilled and I am totally happy that, that you know, the uh, elementary schools are able to go back, I'm a little bit confused. So can you help reconcile how it was a constraint back then and now it is no longer a constraint? You know, we even asked if we were getting creative last summer with, with space using, you know, gyms, et cetera. And, you know, I, I'm just, I'm still confused. So did we somehow add some space? Thank you for your time. Um, I'll address that because, you know, not, nothing has changed. The, the, the guidance that we received at the beginning of the school year is basically the guidance we receive now. As Dr. Mingle has pointed out on numerous occasions, the district went from yellow to orange. I believe those, I have the colors right. And under the orange designation, they encouraged us to go to full virtual learning. But we didn't, we kept the kids in school. And then as soon as we went back to yellow, we started bringing the kids back. So third grade came back full-time starting today. On the agenda today, we just approved grades four and five. And today we also approved directing the administration to bring back the middle school. The difference about bringing the kids back to school, which you point out is we have been operating up until this point under the assumption that we were going to abide by the guidelines. The question that we sent out asking the, the, the community directly whether or not you were okay with not following the guidelines in some manner to bring the kids back to school, would that be your preference? The answer came back over 70% of the kids that were in school already in the middle school, over 70% of those kids said, or those parents said, yes, I'm comfortable with that. So we as a board heard that and we said, okay, we can now take the position that we no longer necessarily need to adhere to the six foot. We can move to three feet because the town is comfortable with it, but there are going to be other protocols put in place in order to maintain the three foot, which will allow more kids to come back to school. I hope that explains or answers your question, but this hey. is not something that's changed. We, we've, the only thing that's changed is, our, is the board's position with respect to the social distancing as it's been established by the CDC and the NJDOE. Thank you. I really appreciate that. My wife would also like to ask. 33 Washington Valley, Nelly Pucci. As you said, nothing has changed and really it's the same policy. But the one thing that we can do is take away the six months of the children not having been in school for five days a week and knowing that those constraints were really not there because other districts did find a way and did get creative. And those questions although I'm thankful that Mr. Franco, you led the way two weeks ago to ask that question, should have been asked because those questions I was asking in the summer when we put a parent survey, I cannot understand how we went six months without that question being followed up when we had over 85% of the families who responded to that survey saying they would give up transportation to get their children back in school and that we knew there was enough space within the schools to have children back five days. So I think we still can't negate that those children did not go to school for five days for six months. No one's gonna take that learning curve. No one's gonna take that back time from that children from losing that love of learning. So that has to be addressed and not just pretend to brush it under the rug like nothing ever happened. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Pucci. Mrs. Armayo. Hello. Jennifer Armeo, 24 Briarwood Drive East, proud parent of three students here in Warren. Um, I'd like to bring up something that uh, Mr. Franco, you mentioned in the beginning of your remarks earlier this evening, that you're bringing back um, fourth and fifth grade with no adjustment to the six foot guidance that is recommended 
Um, so if there's no change, why is it taking so long to bring them back? Why couldn't they have been brought back today when third grade came back? Um, I would like to like have an explanation to why it's taken over a hundred days to bring the fourth and fifth graders back if you're not making any changes to the setup of the six feet spacing. Um, also, I, I saw in earlier, Dr. Mingle had um, did in his presentation how the board approves the recommendation to bring back a specific grade, such as fourth and fifth grade tonight. And then there's a two week lag before they actually come back. I'd like to know why isn't all of that back end work being worked out so that you can make the vote tonight and maybe on Wednesday, the students can come back. Why aren't we um, doing the back work ahead of time in anticipation of a positive vote for them to come back? It seems like it's just more time that the students are not getting in the classroom. Um, and I also feel like the middle school kids, we need to get them back. Um, every day you see another article, a mental health decline of students that are not in school. And for students that are not doing well in school, that social interaction, that teacher interaction um, are all parts of the glue that keeps them going and getting to go through the day by, by day. Being home is not good for the students that are on the lower end of the learning curve. And by not bringing back the middle school kids back sooner, you're failing them as educators. We need to get those kids back in school. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Almeo. Mr. Jokey. Hello, uh, Todd Jokey, Nine Heritage Drive. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, thank you to the uh, members of the Warren School System um, we love our school, we love our teachers, and this is why we are fighting to get our kids back um, with you because we know that they will succeed with you. Um, Mr. Franco, thank you for finally presenting a question to the parents of the Warren School District, a yes or no question that pertains to the students returning back to school. Um, for a long time, a lot of the questions have been about feelings, whether you agree, strongly agree, disagree, um, this leaves a lot of room for ambiguity and a large window for misinterpretation. Um, with this last question, very simply, we found out how badly and what uh, the parents are willing to do to get these kids back in school. Um, my question is, um, of course, we want, we, we want everybody back in school. We want, I want to see all the middle schoolers. I can only imagine how difficult it is to be a teenager, a preteen at this time, only going to school for a couple hours a week. It's gotta be torture for them. Um, so the question is, once we get back to five days a week, what are the logistical hurdles preventing the students from a full day of school? And what are the mitigating factors to overcome each of those hurdles? These are probably prime examples as to why a yes or no question is such a useful thing because if you present them to the parents, um, we, could, we could give a definitive yes or no, what are we willing to do for our kids? I think the number one focus from now moving forward over the next month or so, hopefully over the next week or so, is getting every single kid into the school five days a week. So when we get to the summer, our only goal is to how do we get our kids in school five days a week for full days. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jokey. Mrs. Singleton. Rachel Singleton, 22 Dealwood Trail West in Warren. Um, first, I want to say, uh, congratulate Harry Franco for saying the Pledge of Allegiance. That was awesome. Way to go. Um, Mr. Franco, I wanted to thank you too for the question uh, like Mr. Pucci and Mr. Jokey have said uh, in, in regards to the distancing. Um, I was under the impression that that was going to be discussed um, listening the, the findings of that survey, or I might have misunderstood the opening um, when that was, that was mentioned, because um, I'd be very interested to know um, what the breakdown was per grade and per school too, because obviously I have middle schoolers who need, who need to get back into middle school. And um, that's important to me to know uh, where the middle school parents stand on that. Um, 
And also, I would say thank you because in two weeks' time, I'm going to have a fourth grader who's going back to school. So he'll have only been out for just over a year. Um, but I want to echo Mrs. Almeo's comments too, that, you know, why, does, why is there such a, a lag in this? Why can't they be going back this week with the third grade? Why can't they, why can't they be going back next week? Why do we have to wait two weeks? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Singleton. Mr. Ryder. Hey, Mr. Franco, just uh, apologies, Mr. Ryder. Just crook. Uh, I think we've had 15 minutes, so just a motion to go for another 15 minutes. Uh, we have two people left, so a motion to include the last two people. Okay, second. Board members only. We have three people now. Let's go for the three people. Okay. okay. Warren Township Board of Education members only. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Public commentary has been expanded for the three people that are already in the queue. Mr. Ryder. Thank you. Mike Ryder, 138 Mountain View Road. I, uh, I applaud you guys for uh, attending these uh, meetings. Uh, and I know there must be a lot of back channel time uh, discussing a lot of these topics and uh, meeting with consultants and architects. Uh, but um, I think uh, the parents of Warren that aren't privy to the meetings that you're at uh, are dying for transparency. Our imaginations are a fertile uh, landscape uh, for questions we don't understand uh, as the prior speakers have mentioned why it's taking so long. Um, if there is a plan, um, and I understand uh, from last uh, the last meeting that uh, Dr. Mengel and others are working 14 hours a day on this plan, uh, why are we not allowed to see the full plan and its scope? And, and if it's out there, I would love to know where it is because uh, we've been looking for it and can't find it. Uh, if at least we knew where the goalposts were, uh, we wouldn't believe that they were being moved every week um, to uh, keep us from getting our kids back in school. Uh, I'm the parent, uh, and my wife, Angela, here, we're parents of two middle school kids, and uh, they are dying. That, 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 that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but uh, this was not here last year. Uh, the stress and drama that it's taken the toll on the parents going back and forth with teachers, this work's missing, this work's not missing. You gotta look in this calendar. No, you're not looking in the right place. You gotta look on uh, Genesis. Uh, no, you gotta look in Google Classroom. No, we have a separate special calendar over here on the right. It's madness and it's taken a toll on the kids. And then when they're in class, when they're in class, they finish the work in the first five minutes and then are bored. And then the teachers become concerned and angry with the kids. And I get emails that your child is not staring at the screen with the rest of the children because he's finished the work. He's gonna do the other work, but he's not allowed to do that either. I don't think everyone's understanding here. And it surprised some of the teachers too. When I showed them what we see from the parent side in the Genesis portal, that it doesn't show all of the things that they think that we should be seeing. There's a huge disconnect going on. And the, the amount of stress that's being created is phenomenal. And it's, un, it's now pushed the balance of uh, th the threshold of where uh, kids need to be. They need to be in school. Uh, in the format that they've been used to for years, that's been working, it's been proven. Where is the plan? Provide the plan, give us the transparency. We know that about 70% of kids, of parents with kids that are currently in school are in favor of a full return. Well, what percent of the kids are fully remote? This Mr. Help. Roger, that's three minutes. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Thank Have you. Uh, Maneri, Mr. or Mrs. Hi, uh, this is Gretchen Maneri. I'm at One Monday Lane. Um, I wanted to say that I, uh, I have the same question as Mrs. Armeo as far as if we had, I, I sort of was under the impression we didn't have the capability or the facility space to bring all the fourth and fifth graders back. Um, I'm glad we do. I just don't understand why we didn't know that we did um, prior to that, that all of a sudden we can bring them back now. I'm sort of confused as to how that went. 
Um, I also agree with Mr. Ryder as far as the moving of the goalposts. I think this has been a question I've had from the beginning as far as how do we, um, maybe if you could give us a clearer sort of pathway. I think if there's clear metrics for us as parents to follow and what we needed, I mean, we do this when you develop a, a, a drug down the pipeline 10 years, we have metrics. And I feel like we've lacked any sort of clear metrics and focus and it has created this um, atmosphere of um, confusion and of um, distrust. And um, I guess I also would say that I agree with Mr. Fallon as far as the regionalization, as far as what we're missing. I, I have a fourth and sixth grader. I also have a 10th and 12th grader at Watching Hills. And they both had things that were missing from Warren, which is very disappointing when you get your child through a K to eight system and have them missing things for the high school that we feed into. Um, I have reached out to, for example, recently, Mr. Villar about our lack of foreign language uh, capabilities when we reach the high school and uh, was very much put to the side um, with the thanks, but no thanks for your input. And I think that uh, I would love there to be some sort of way that we could maybe reach out. I mean, my suggestion was just having more actual vocal interactions in language because that is what our kids are missing, I found. Um, and I wonder if there isn't um, some sort of way that if, I mean, I hate to suggest forming more committees, but some sort of way that people who have had the high schoolers and still have these kids kind of know what they're going to be missing, because I feel like I know what's going to be missing. And I, I would love to stop it from missing for my next two. If there's a way that there's some sort of forum that we could speak on or way to address things that we saw missing, because we have that benefit of this vision um, to share with what we think might enhance our children's education. That's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Maneri. Uh, Mr. Mr. Joya. Adam Joya, 14 Sherwood Way. Um, so each of these board meetings, I see the same parents stressing concerns. Um, I've been sitting back listening and I see those same questions are unanswered. Um, and I agree with Mike Ryder. Uh, there's a complete lack of transparency. So when you guys are asking us to vote on these capital improvements, lack of transparency, planning, lack of transparency. Um, you know, perception becomes reality. Um, we're forgetting about the middle school children, okay? You're taking children that were in the fifth grade who missed a month, two months of the fifth grade, and you're placing them in the middle school and you're calling them middle school students. But yesterday, they are fifth grade students. They're still repeating, and right now they're learning, fifth grade math. Why we waited till the end, until nine o'clock at night to talk about our children again, our greatest assets are in the back burner once again. So a comment was made last board meeting that children are learning new things. They are. They're learning that they're being forgotten, that they're not cared for. They're learning how to hibernate in their bedrooms. It's unacceptable, okay? Uh, we need to get the kids back to school. Uh, we haven't seen what are the results from the I ready. Has, has the board asked that question of the district? Are the grades skyrocketing or have they dropped? Um, you know, you're talking about regionalization. We, we have dif differences right now between classrooms, let alone between the schools within Warren. We're teaching to the lowest level. Uh, we need to concentrate and fix our own backyard first. We need to get these kids back in school. The reason we want them back in school is because distance learning does not work. And your test results show that. And that's why you're not putting them up. Again, lack of transparency. Okay? So please be transparent with us. We're asking for board uh, for town hall meetings. You guys are hiding behind these surveys. We've been asking for this since July 20th. You know what they did in one year? They built the Umpire State Building in one year and 43 days. We're still trying to figure out how to get our kids back in school. Come on, guys. And we're waiting until nine o'clock. It's not fair to our kids. It's not respectful to the parents that are here to advocate for their children. I'm asking you guys, please. Get our kids back to school, okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and just a reminder, on today's board meeting, we just voted to bring more kids back to school starting in two weeks. And we also gave the directive to bring the middle school back um, in, a, in, in basically four weeks time. So I understand that may not be good enough for some of you, but uh, as explained, and I, I don't know where this lack of transparency ideas coming from, we've, we've been 
pretty thorough all along the way explaining where the decision making is coming from. And for the last several months since October, as I pointed out earlier in the meeting, this is not, we didn't wait till nine o'clock to talk about this. We mentioned that since the color code system that the state has, we don't drive it. The state has put us in orange. The directive under the CDC and the NJDOE guidelines was under orange, don't bring more kids back to school. In fact, try to send all of your kids home and do virtual. So that's been the directive and we've been saying it all along. I said today, the only difference between today and the last several months is two things. One is we're no longer in orange, we're in yellow, which allows us to have a little more freedom. And two, we are now giving the directive to the administration to come up with a plan which does not follow the CDC guidelines. We heard you and we're reacting to that. Now, as far as why we can't just swing the doors open tomorrow and let the kids come in is because we still have to follow the guidelines to some extent. You have to have state approval for the, the plan to bring the kids back. If you're not following the, so, the, the, the social distance guidelines, you have to have additional protocols in place. That takes time. You also, um, you know, to have the full day and have the kids mingle at lunch. These would all be violations of the state guidelines in some way, which then could create liabilities for the school district. So we are doing everything we can. We heard you, we are acting, and the kids will be coming back to school. Third grade came back today, fourth and fifth grade coming back in two weeks, and the middle school will be back in four weeks time. This is happening. I know that might be, not be quick enough for some of you, but the, there is planning that needs to happen. As far as the space in the middle school, you can have all the space in the world. If you don't have the staff to teach the kids, it's not gonna work. So these are all things that have to be figured out. And that takes time, unfortunately. So we are, the, the administration is working hard. The board has listened to you. We heard your concerns. Now, with respect to the results of the survey, I did mention earlier, and maybe it wasn't as clear. Of the, and, and the survey results matter specifically with respect to the middle school. And I'll focus on that because we're able to bring back the K through fives. Right, so in the middle school, 72% of cohort A and B, those are the kids that are already in school, ignoring the kids that are already at home, 72%. And it's basically that number grade by grade. It varies a couple of points, but it's basically that number that say we're willing to go below six feet in order to send our kid back to school five days a week. There's going to be follow up from Dr. Mingle on those issues because there's going to be additional questions that have to come. Well, are you comfortable with plexiglass dividers, which are probably going to be needed if we reduce the spacing? You can't just ignore all these other rules as much as we would like to, or you would like us to. It's just not possible. Okay, I'll end there. I can address a few things, Mr. Franco. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mingle. Uh, so, um, sorry, lost my notes as I started talking. All right, so a few things. Um, in the in the last meeting, there was, I understand it was very lengthy, but there was a lengthy presentation on the district website that goes through the limiters and how we overcome them or can't and what the implications are. One of the reasons it takes time is that it's quite a logistical puzzle, not an insurmountable one. And if you go very quickly without taking care of all of those different pieces, you wind up making huge errors that have problems for kids. So I would encourage you, the districts that you're seeing with headlines that says all kids come back five days or full days or whatever you hear, to go beyond the headlines, which I said last time. Many of those districts, I talked to administrators, parents, friends of mine happen to have you know, kids in school districts that are uh, have their middle school students back five days, for example. There are regular, quarantines of entire grade levels, classrooms, and, and et cetera. What we're trying to do, and one of the reasons why our fourth and fifth grade plan is two weeks out and not tomorrow, is coming up with plans that will allow us to not have to backtrack. So one of the key things is you ramp it up piece by piece so that you can study the variables that you put in place. So we brought back third grade. We were able to do that without making any busing changes. So now that's in place, we can make sure everything's smooth. Fourth and fifth grade requires us changing the entire bus system 
and pulling several hundred kids off of our buses. That's going to mean that arrival and dismissal procedures will have to be completely revamped at our four elementary schools. If we do that poorly, people will be very upset. If we do it well and take an extra week to do it, people will have a smoother experience. That's just one example. Spacing is lower on the problem list. You might remember from last summer that we actually went out and priced out private spaces. We looked at private schools that had closed. We did all kinds of things to try to make sure we could bring back as many kids as possible. But the, even if you resolve the spacing issue, it comes with implications. So Mr. Franco mentioned staffing. What's different now than September? Well, now our high risk staff members are finally getting vaccinated. And so our high risk staff members who have had leaves of absence or have accommodations that limit what they're able to do in person are finally able to go back to full duty. That is extremely helpful to us. In addition, as I mentioned in my opening comments, all educators will be on that list soon. That will make some additional staffing available to us, but there are implications. So I, if, you, if you didn't hear the presentation at the beginning of the meeting, I would encourage you to watch it tomorrow. But in order to bring back fourth and fifth grade, we will be moving some classes into places like libraries. Once you do that, it removes the ability to make other decisions down the road. So for example, if we wanted to go to full days, we now don't have libraries available to run our library classes. If we take a music room and turn it into a classroom, these are the kinds of things that'll happen at the middle school. If we go back um, to five days with using every available space, then you can't run the full schedule because the classes that kids go to, those rooms are not available. In addition, we're using all of those staff members outside of the core homerooms to help us cover absent teachers. So for example, uh, in the month of February, we were only able to provide subs for 51% of the requests from our staff. And I have to give another, I, I know I shout out the staff every meeting. Our staff is coming to work under whatever trying conditions they have to, they're not taking off because they know that it places a burden on their colleagues. And so staffing, uh, the space, the transportation, the color-coded guidance, even today on March 1st, according to the CDC guidelines, our school should be completely closed. We have made a conscious decision that we feel our safety protocols are high enough that even with the CDC saying our school should be closed at the secondary level of the middle school, that we know that we can do better than that. So uh, that comes into play. The, one of the other pieces that I think um, sometimes we, we don't think about if it's not our position is that even at about 70% of in-school middle school parents saying they support going below six feet, that means 30% don't support it. Those are parents of kids who currently go to school. And so we have to take that into consideration too. That doesn't even go into what does our local health official say? What legal guidance do we get, which we can never speak about in public? What does our staff think? So on and so forth. So it, there are a lot of complicated factors. There's definitely no hiding of that information. Every presentation we've ever made all the way back to last March, I think it was March 11th when I sent the letter home about the original closure is all available on the website so everybody can see it. Um, you know, and there was a question there or a suggestion that sounded like that we're hiding student performance data. The iReady parent re reports for math went home last week and the reading ones go home this week. That information was shared with the curriculum committee today. It literally didn't exist earlier to do it than today so that they can see that. And, you know, we, and then the curriculum committee reports out at the next meeting so that everybody in the public knows uh, what information is available. I think, you know, one of the questions to think about would be, you know, are, are we willing to challenge our own assumptions? So the board was willing to challenge its assumption about six feet distancing. We asked the question, we got the answer and we're responding to it. What if the results of the iReady assessments show that the students who have been home are performing better? Or what if the middle school students were performing better than elementary? Or what if all students grew? These are the kinds of questions we do ask of the data. Uh, that'll be reported out the next meeting from the curriculum committee. Uh, so we're, we're definitely open to that feedback. We take it, we act on it. Um, but I would, I would also remind you that there's a lot of feedback from people you don't hear at these meetings. I shared with the board, uh, third, I think it was 34 emails or something like that from the last meeting. Uh, sometimes there are other pieces of feedback coming than just what is in public commentary, but all of it's important. So I think that answers the questions, Mr. Uh, Franco. Oh, sorry, the one last one. Um, Mrs. Maneri, if you feel like you didn't get the appropriate response from the building administration, definitely reach out to Mr. Kimmick. Uh, as Mr. Fallon said earlier, we're actually really aggressive about the way we articulate between eighth grade and ninth grade. And as he alluded to, uh, our staff takes the lead on much of that, um, including in world language. Uh, I do have a copy of the, the email exchange, happy to address those concerns uh, through the chain of command. Thank you. 
Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mingle. Uh, that brings us to the end of the meeting. Motion to adjourn. Second. You're muted, Mrs. Lamar. I'm sorry. Almost made it through. All the Warren Township board members only. All those in favor of adjourning? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? I wish everyone a wonderful evening. Thank, Thank you. you.